Hey everybody, happy Monday. Uh, I'm going to jump right in here. Remember, you have a formative assessment tonight, 8.C is the last formative of this unit, and then we'll be testing on Wednesday. All right, jumping right in. So, uh, up until this point, we've been talking about banking, and we ended Friday talking about the multiplied impact, saying that every, uh, every dollar, I should say, that's deposited becomes a loan. At least the excess reserves of that become a loan. Those excess reserves when they become a loan, also become somebody else's checkbook deposit. A repeat a portion of that set aside, the other portion is put into reserves, and then that's lent out again over and over and over again. So a little change in excess reserves can have a big impact on the supply of money. And then we end up by, by giving kind of the equation, and this is a really important equation for this unit. The equation is first you have to find the money multiplier. Step one, money multiplier is one over the reserve ratio. Reserve ratio set by the Federal Reserve that says the percentage of checkable deposits that has to be set aside. So if one, if my reserve ratio is 10%, what's my money multiplier? It's gonna be 10, one over 0.1. If it's 20%, what's my money multiplier? That's gonna be five, one over 0.2. Very good. So, and you've already, uh, Memorize most of those for the uh, our MPC and what we're looking at uh, the money multiplier. So All right jumping right into the next thing then you take your money multiplier and you multiply it by your excess reserves very important excess reserves times your money multiplier not Checkable deposits, right? They need just the excess. Those are the only ones that can be lent so your goal and everything that you do for this is to find those excess reserves once you find your excess reserves, you can uh, then multiply by the money multiplier and you'll find the change in the supply of money as a result. So if my excess reserves are $10 million, my money multiplier is five, then 10 times five equals a change, the potential change in the supply of money of $50 million. Now, what you'll often be given is they'll either tell you that bonds have been bought by the Fed or uh, new, there's a new deposit. And they'll ask you how much that changes the supply of money. Keep in mind, whenever there's a new deposit, deposit, you have an extra step. If $100 is put into the bank and the reserve ratio is 10%, then I cannot multiply that $100 times 10 I have to first find the excess reserves. So I take that $100, I multiply it by my reserve ratio. This is 10%. So 100 times 0.1 or $10 has to be set aside. I cannot touch it. Those are my required reserves. Everything else is my excess reserves. So that $90 is my excess reserves. Multiply that by 10, $90 by 10, the potential impact to change the supply of money is $900. Now, with bonds, you don't have that extra stage, right? If the bonds are being bought from the bank, bonds, don't, bonds go down, reserves go up. So if $100 worth of bonds is bought from the bank, then my bonds will go down by $100 in that balance sheet. But my reserves, my excess reserves, will go up by $100. So excess reserves go up by an entire $100. You multiply 100 times that 10, it's going to have an impact of $1,000. So that same $100 for deposit only has a $900 impact. $1,000 impact for bonds, because none of that is required reserves. All of that goes right into excess. But only $900 for deposits because a portion of that has to be set aside for required. And only the rest, those excess reserves, actually get lent out into the banking system. Okay, let's try a couple. All right, this is an example of something you might see. You got a reserve ratio of 10%, and they ask an increase of checkable deposits of $500 as the potential to increase the supply of money by. And so your gut reaction might be uh, $5,000, right? $500 times 0.1 or 1 over 0.1 times 10 is $5,000. But we actually have to do a little bit of extra work. Remember, whenever it's a checkable deposit, a portion of that has to be set aside and to require reserves. So 10% of my $500 has to be set aside. So I take $500, I multiply it by 0.1. 
I know that $50 have to be set aside. So I take $50 and put them in required reserves. What's left over is $450. That $450 is what actually gets lent out. Those are my excess reserves. So that $450 is what gets multiplied. Remember, it's excess reserves times the money multiplier. The 450 times 10 gives me the correct answer of $4,500 in the increase in the supply of money. We always say it has the potential to increase the supply of money by that much because uh, at, the banks don't have to lend all of that money, right? That's the maximum amount that the supply of money could change. So just keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes that language is, uh, can be a, a burden for you or a stumbling block, I should say. All right, moving on. Let's try this one. So it says the reserve ratio is 0.25, which means my money multiplier is going to be 1 over 0.25 or 4. The Fed purchases $50 million of bonds from the banks. So if they're buying bonds, what's happening to the supply of money? Remember, it's buy big. So when they buy bonds, they're taking bonds away from the banks, giving them money. So the supply of money is going to go up. The Fed purchases $50 million with potential impact on the supply of money. Now, all you got to do is multiply that $50 million by the money multiplier because when the Fed buys bonds, it does not change required reserves at all. We're not dealing with checkable deposits, right? The reserve ratio only requires you put a portion of checkable deposits aside to make sure that people can withdraw their money in the future. So all $50 million are going to go into excess reserves. And we know it's excess reserves times my money multiplier, which gives us that change in the supply of money. So I take 1 over 0.25, which is going to be 4. 4. That's my money multiplier. And then I take my excess reserves, which is going to be positive 50, right? Because they were bought, the bonds were bought, so positive 50, 50 million times four. We're going to have a total impact of $200 million as a result. Okay, hopefully that made a little bit of sense. So that's pretty much how it works. Bonds, all total impact, all of that money goes into excess reserves. And keep in mind, if the Fed sells, this is going to be a negative number. We're going to be decreasing the supply of money. Just like if somebody withdraws money from the uh, bank, it decreases the potential impact on the supply of money. All right. Uh, what comes next are just a couple of step-by-steps for each of the tools. So some of you uh, like to have these types of things, like, hey, if you're given this question, here are the steps you should take. Uh, so I'm giving you these. We'll do more calculations with them tomorrow just as a review, uh, seeing, looking at problems that will probably be on the test. So first is if there's an increase or decrease in demand deposits or checkable deposits. The most important thing to keep in mind here is you need to calculate required reserves and excess reserves every time, right? So first of all, keep in mind, that when there's a change in checkable deposit, there's no initial change in the supply of money. It's just somebody taking cash and putting it into checkable deposits. So the M1, both of those are M1. It's just the composition of it is changing. There's a little less cash. There's a little more checkable deposit. But it's all money, right? So there's no initial change in the supply of money when a new deposit is put in the bank. Then you calculate your excess reserves. The change in the deposit times or the all of your deposits times that reserve ratio in hundreds, right? So if I have a $100 deposit going and my reserve ratio is 25%, then $25 are my required reserves. Then I need to calculate my excess reserves. It's my total reserves minus my required. So my total reserves were 100. I subtract 25. And so my excess reserves are going to be 75. And then once I find an excess reserves, I want to multiply that by the money multiplier, and that will give me the change in the supply of money. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Uh, next, if there's an increase or decrease in bonds, buying or selling bonds, remember, buy big, sell small. If the Fed is buying bonds from the banks, then the supply of money is going up. If the Fed is selling bonds to the banks, then the supply of money is going down. All right, so let's say there's a... When a bond is bought or sold, the first thing you have to keep in mind is that initial change in the dollars of bonds that are bought or sold, that initial change is 
immediately a change in the supply of money. So if $100 are bought from the banks by the Federal Reserve, then the supply of money immediately increases by $100. That's money that didn't used to be in the system, that now is because it's coming from the Fed, the black hole of our economy, going into the banks. So keep that in mind. There is an initial change with bonds, not with a uh, new deposit. Okay? And then remember that it's a direct impact on our excess reserves. If $100 is bought from the, the banks by the Federal Reserve, then the excess reserves are going to increase by that full $100. So excess reserves are going to be $100 times my money multiplier. That'll give you your supply of money, your change in the supply of money. But there's really no additional steps here. It's really, really simple, right? Uh, hundred. The, the biggest stumbling block on this one is just remembering that buying bonds increases the supply of money and selling them decreases it. Okay, we'll do some more examples of that in class tomorrow. Next, increasing or decreasing the reserve ratio. Remember, this is a tool that the Federal Reserve can use. They don't like using it. It's like using a sledgehammer to drive a nail. It's not the, the best tool for the job, but uh, it is a tool and you should know how to do it. Uh, it's rare, but they might say, hey, the reserve ratio changes. What should you do? So first, you have to recalculate the multiplier. So if the reserve ratio went from 25% to 10%, then I have to recalculate my multiplier. So my multiplier went from 4, or 1 over 0.25, to 10, 1 over 0.1. So it's a significant increase in the multiplier. Then you calculate your excess reserves times your multiplier for both of them, right? Because you're, what you're really trying to do is see what, what what's the change in the supply of money because of this. So excess reserves times four, if it's $100 of excess reserves times four is $400. Then you calculate the potential impact with your new multiplier. So $100 times 10 or $1,000. So old is 400, new is 1,000, and then the difference between those is the increase in the supply of money. So if my new is 1,000, my old was 400, then by decreasing the reserve ratio, I increase the supply of money by $600, okay? Again, it's rare, but it's pretty logical. Just recalculate it and then compare old to new, and you should be in good shape. All right, so let's try this out. So let's say the reserve ratio fell from 50% to 25%. The impact of a $100 purchase of bonds by the Fed grows from blank to blank. So if the Fed is purchasing $100 of bonds from the banks, remember that that means we are increasing, we're increasing the supply of money by that exact amount initially, and then it's going to have a full multiplied effect. So, First, my old uh, money multiplier was 1 over 0.5, or 2. My $100 times 2, so my excess reserves times 2, is going to be my initial supply of money, which is $200. Then I take my, I calculate my new money multiplier, 1 over 0.25. 1 over 0.25 kicks out 4, so my $100 times 4 is $400. So the Fed grew the supply of money from $200 to $400 as a result of that change in supply of money. I could also say they increase the supply of money by $200. All right, which is the difference between these two. Okay, very close. Now, what happens if a bank accidentally goes below the required reserves? Uh, this actually happens quite a bit. And remember, it's federal law, so banks have to have enough money in their required reserves to cover. So if they don't, the banks have a couple of options. First, they can borrow from another bank. Um, banks actually give out overnight loans to each other just to cover their reserves. And they uh, lend by something called the federal funds rate. That's the rate that they pay, the interest that they pay when banks are lending to banks overnight. And then next day, they get all their money back in. They have so many transactions that pay off that loan in a single day. So that's the federal funds rate. Uh, then they could also borrow from the Federal Reserve. 
right? Straight up, the Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort, and they pay the discount rate. That's the interest that you pay for that particular loan. So those are the two things you can do. Banks do it all the time. They either borrow from the Fed or they borrow from another bank. So whenever you're asked this question, and you will be asked this question, they'll say, hey, what happens if, you know, the go below, they do not have enough in the required reserves because all that money's withdrawn or they lent too much of it out. Uh, what could they do? And you'll know that they can either borrow from another bank, paying the, disc, the federal funds rate, or they can borrow from the Federal Reserve. Keep that in mind, and you should be in pretty good shape. All right, Section F, and this is our last section, the loanable funds market and the crowding out effect. So let's jump in. So the loanable funds market is the interaction of those excess reserves. Remember I kept calling those excess reserves loanable funds? Well, the, it's a little different than the supply of money. It's the supply of loanable funds, and actually the supply and demand of it uh, creates the interest rate. So the demanders in our loanable funds market are the borrowers. These are people that want to take out loans. The suppliers are the savers or the lenders, the banks themselves, mostly the banks. Is not the same as the money market, right? There, there is a relationship between supply and demand on this. It will always kick out the real interest rate. So remember when we were dealing with the money of the market? Uh, the money market, I should say, with the vertical supply of money and the downward slope and demand of money. That's a nominal interest rate because it's not corrected for inflation. But in the loanable funds market, we do correct for inflation. So just keep that in mind. Remember the difference between nominal and real. Nominal interest rate is actually what the borrower pays because it's not corrected for inflation. The real interest rate is corrected for inflation. That's actually the profit of the banks. They charge nominal, but portion of that's inflation, so they only get to keep or actually see increases through the real interest rates as a result. That's what's used in this loanable funds market, right? And um, there's that little equation for you. Remember, nominal minus inflation equals real every single time. Nominal minus inflation, when we're dealing with percentages, will give you real interest rates. All right, so let's look at the graph itself, and it's pretty simple. You have downward sloping demand curve, upward sloping supply curve. You have your interest rates and your quantity of loans. Just a normal thing. Probably the hardest thing to remember about this is that you're using real interest rates, not nominal interest rates. right? And so when this increases or decreases, when people demand more loans or less loans, then that can increase and decrease the interest rates um, in our markets and have an impact on everything else, just like we saw before. Now, why do we go over this? We go over this because of deficit spending, right? So far, we've been looking at the changes in supply of money and how that impacts the interest rates. But we have a competing interest here, which is the government. The government spends money they don't have all the time. We call it deficit spending. When they do this, it increases the demand for loanable funds. They need people's money in order to be able to do this, right? They're issuing all of those bonds. That's people giving them loans. It's the finite amount of quantity of loanable funds that are being given to the government so that they can buy a new tank or a new jet plane or whatever, right? So the demand, the demand for the loanable funds goes up significantly, shifts to the right, billions and billions of dollars in one fell swoop. And as a result, it pushes up the interest rate. When the interest rate goes up, it causes crowding out. This is why we use the loanable funds market, to demonstrate the crowding out effect. Remember, we said crowding out is when the government spending crowds out private spending. When interest rates rise, investment falls. We know this. We did this earlier in the unit. So when interest rates rise because simply the government was spending money they don't have, they are losing out on future investment that could cause economic growth. That's the crowding out effect with the loanable funds market. All right, here are some shifters for it. Um, and it it's important to know these, but they're, they're pretty self-explanatory. I'll go over them real quick. Um, but the most important shifter is deficit spending, for sure. The only reason we look at the loanable funds market is because it demonstrates the problem with deficit spending. 
And we know that that competes with our change in supply of money. So over here, we have the Federal Reserve increasing and decreasing the supply of money with their cute little mechanisms, change in reserve ratio, buying bonds, all that stuff, right? But on the flip side, competing with that, we have increases and decreases in the demand for loanable funds, which is also impacting our interest rates and can actually work against that. If I'm working to lower interest rates in one market, with the government spending money they don't have in another market, then my investment is really not going in the direction I want it to go. All right? So let's go over these shifters real quick. Uh, demand shifters, sh things that will shift the demand of the loanable funds market are uh, changes in perceived business opportunities. If, hey, there's more expected rate of return, I bet I could uh, do install this new technology and be a lot better off then they'll demand loanable funds so that they can actually make that happen. But the biggest one is changes in government borrowing, right? When the government runs a deficit, that deficit is spent for with loanable funds. So the demand for loanable funds goes right. And then if they uh, have a surplus, which is rare, but if they did, then they don't need as many loanable funds. So the demand of loanable funds shifts to the left and interest rates fall. Uh, then for the supply side, just think about the banks or the, the consumers that are saving their money. Um, changes in private saving behavior, if we all decide to start saving more, for example, that will increase the supply of loanable funds. So more money will be in the banks, which then can be excess reserves and can be lent out. Um, public savings. So when the government saves money, they do that. Yeah, not very often, but if they did, and that change, it would change the supply because more money would be in the bank for excess reserves. A foreign investment will go won't go into detail on that one, but you know when when foreign nations invest in our our banking systems, they can increase the amount of funds in our banking system, which increases our loanable funds or excess reserves. So shifting supply to the right. And then any changes in expected profitability could increase or decrease the supply of money. If I feel like I'm going to be a lot more profitable by putting my money in the bank, then I'm more likely to do it. Okay, but I'm going to reach back here one more time. Most important part of this is remembering the crowding out effect. That when the government spends money they don't have, the demand shift rate pushes up that interest rate, crowds out investment, investment decreases as a result. Right, And this can, is happening all the time, and goes in direct contrast to what we're trying to do with the supply of money and our monetary policy. Okay, I hope that was helpful for you. And uh, tomorrow we'll review all these things, draw a couple of these loanable funds, talk about what's actually going to be on the test. All right, have yourselves a wonderful Monday, and I will see you tomorrow.